Good morning, and welcome to Grove United Methodist Church. Two years ago, when I moved into this office, I found a little pack of mustard seeds. Do you know the parable of the mustard seed in Luke? Well, if you haven't, I feel like it's time you begun. Welcome, and let us worship God together. We gather as God's people, bringing our fears and pain, knowing that when our spirits have grown cold, God rekindles the gift of faith in us. We gather as God's people, hanging our broken hearts on the branches of the tree of life, knowing that while friends may turn against us, God transforms enemies into sisters and brothers. We gather as God's people, hungering for healing and hope, knowing that even when life is no picnic, God prepares a feast for us. Praise to passages of scripture, Paul offers Timothy guidance and assurance about a life of faith, 
and Jesus instructs his disciples what a life of faith is like. It is our prayer that we may be able to draw guidance for lives of faith from these teachings. The first reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, the first 14 verses. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, to promote the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm grateful to God, whom I serve with a good conscience, as my ancestors did. I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I can be filled with happiness. I'm reminded of your authentic faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside you. Because of this, I'm reminding you to revive God's gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share the suffering for the good news, depending on God's power. God is the one who saved and called us with a holy calling. This wasn't based on what we have done, but it was based on his own purpose and grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now his grace is revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus. He destroyed death and brought life and immortality into clear focus through the good news. I was appointed a messenger, apostle, and teacher of this good news. This is also why I'm suffering the way I do, but I'm not ashamed. I know the one in whom I've placed my trust. I'm convinced that God is powerful enough to protect what he has placed in my trust until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Protect this good thing that has been placed in your trust through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Would any of you say to your servant who had just come in from the field after plowing or tending sheep, come, sit down for dinner? Wouldn't you say instead, fix my dinner, put on the clothes of a table servant and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you can eat and drink. You won't thank the servant because the servant did what you asked, will you? In the same way, when you have done everything required of you, you should say, we servants deserve no special praise. We have only done our duty. Barry, thank you for those beautiful readings. As we begin the sermon today, I'd like for us to reflect on a passage from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith. Faith is the reality of what we hope for. The proof of what we don't see. The reality of what we hope for and the proof of what we do not see. For the next five weeks, we're going to be in a sermon series on how to live faithfully in today's world. Today, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke and also 2 Timothy looking at faith as that which is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. In the Gospel of Luke, the apostles are there with Jesus and they say to Jesus, increase our faith. 
acknowledging that their faith can grow. It's interesting to note, though, that faith is not a matter of the disciples' own strength. They, they recognize that their strength comes from the Lord. In fact, Jesus responds to those disciples conveying that their faith that they currently possess is really not much more than a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's, it's about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. In other words, faith is not something that we can possess. It is truly God's gift to us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says this, We are saved by grace through faith, and that is not our own doing. Again, knowing that this grace and this faith that we possess is because God is who God is. Faith actually, according to Luke, complements what Paul understands about faith, that, that faith enables us to do the work of God in our lives in such a way that um, sometimes it even defies our own human experience. It's things that we hope for or that we don't or that we have seen that the evidence of things that are not seen. It's not it's not like a Halloween trickery. It's not like magic. It's, it's, it's nothing but living lives that are righteous. And we've talked about that before. What is it to live a righteous life? A righteous life is one that is not pompous, but, but humble, humble before God. Uh, and our example of that is seen in Jesus Christ, who came upon this earth in humility as a servant to give his life. To, uh, for others. Faith is to live as a disciple of Christ according to the teachings of Christ. Our faith, well, our faith is really faith when we live in such a way that we do not hinder another. Our faith is really faith when we correct perhaps the the misunderstandings that someone may have about the gospel, but we do it in such a way as not to annihilate, to ostracize, or demean the other. And if it is a means of needing to forgive another person, then, then we forgive that person even as we forgive ourselves. Faith, real faith, is to understand that when we live faith full, in this way, it's, it's not a feather in our cap or a jewel in our crown, but it's truly our duty as disciples of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus. Paul. Paul was an, an elder, if you will, and he, he mentored others in the faith. In particular, in this letter that we read today, he is mentoring Timothy, who is apprenticing and actually over one of the early churches. Paul is writing to Timothy from a Roman prison cell, and we can gather from Paul's writings uh, as he wrote from that Roman cell that he really did not expect to be set free. He wrote uh, to encourage Timothy much the way Moses encouraged Joshua and also as Elijah encouraged Elisha. Timothy himself is a third-generation Christian, his grandmother Lois was a Christian, his mother Eunice was a Christian, and women of, of great faith, and Paul writes about that. Uh, he reminds Timothy of the faith that resided in his mother and grandmother and now is passing to him. And in doing so, Paul in, in many ways passes the mantle as Elijah passed the mantle to Elisha to carry on that faith to the next generation and the generations after that. Paul tells him, don't be timid. Don't be timid, Timothy. Don't be afraid. Fan the flames, he says. Fan the flames of faith in which you were raised. Live out your faith in a spirit of power and love and self-control. That power in love and self-control is that fire that faithfully burns within him that lives out and mirrors the life of Jesus. It's, it's not an unabandoned, unfiltered, uncaring faith toward those who believe or practice differently from Timothy. That would not, that would not be a, 
a faith that would be self-controlled and in love, but would be out of his own power and desires. But this is about God's power and desires for others. Where have you seen that at work in another person in your life? A faith that was lived out in a spirit of God's power, God's love, and God's self-control. One of the people that came to mind as I was preparing for this sermon today was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I went back and, and read his letter from the Birmingham jail. In the 1950s, Dr. Martin Luther King was imprisoned in that Birmingham jail because of his stand against black segregation, a call that he understood to be from God for the salvation, as he termed it, souls, not bodies. Like Paul, Dr. King wrote a letter from his cell, in that, from that Birmingham cell, and, and in that letter, much like the letter to Timothy, and yet unlike that letter to Timothy, King notes um, not a word of encouragement, but a word of correction to eight white religious leaders in the South who issued, quote, a public statement of concern and caution supporting the church's stand on segregation, thereby choosing human stated rights over God's rights for all God's people. As I read that letter, I was shocked again to read that near the close of that letter, King had this to say about the church. He said, the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If the church of today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. I meet young people every day, King says, whose disappointment with the church has risen to outright disgust. This sacrificial spirit that Dr. King wrote of is seen in Paul's letter to Timothy. Timothy, live a life that is faithful a life that will allow you to lean into and to trust God for right at this moment and this time in your history, Timothy, that other generations might come to believe. Faithful, Timothy, in power. Power not granted through your own strength, but granted through the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to reason, to understand, and to teach the truths revealed in Scripture and through the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus. And to use those gifts that God gave you in order to be able to transform the church that you are serving, Timothy, as well as the community and the world. Faithful in love, Timothy. God first, remember. God first, and then that divine love that is evidenced through you of God's love for others. Faithful, Timothy. Faithful in self-control. In this life that is bound up with Jesus. That, that enables your life to look a lot like your Savior Jesus' life. A life that has those divine characteristics such as patience and kindness and humbleness. The Christian virtues that... Paul himself wrote about in 1 Corinthians 13. You see, the gospel, the good news that Timothy was called to present, wasn't his own human stated rights for some bodies, but it was God's rights for all souls worthy of the redemption through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. I asked you earlier, who in your life exhibited that type of faith, that faithful faith that leans in and trusts in God, a faith that has the power of God at work in their lives, a faith that is full of love, a faith that is full of self-control? I hope you will ponder that this week and perhaps reflect more 
on Paul and Timothy as progenitors of the faith that we now receive. Amen and amen. The last several weeks, we have been in the chapel at Grove United Methodist Church recording. The pews that are here are where many of our ancestors sat before us, not just here at 1020 Tyler Avenue, but in the what we call the old church, uh, the church that is down on Grove Avenue where we were first founded. As I sit here today, I am thankful for those who have instilled faith in me through the years and for the generations of the faithful that have gone out into the world to make disciples. As we come to our prayer time today, I'm going to be kneeling at this pew, um, which I will remember that our faith comes from God and also giving thanks for those that have come before us as we lift those on our prayer list and on our hearts. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we turn to your word that enables us to increase our faith in times of natural disaster, disease, and changing times. You remind us in the letter to the Hebrews that faith is the reality of what we hope for and the proof of what we do not see. Give us strength, Lord, for the places that we do not see you at work, and yet we know that your hand is moving, your spirit is moving, your will is moving among your people. We lift to you, Lord, our brothers and sisters in Florida and all along the eastern coast and in Puerto Rico who have suffered the damages from these hurricanes. And we ask God uh, that you will enable to move us that we may respond. We praise you, Lord, for the gift of United Methodist Committee on Relief and for the hands that are already there and the supplies that are already on their way to relieve the suffering and pain of others. We name to you in our hearts those on our prayer list and those that we have not named with our lips. And we trust, Lord, that, that you will meet each need and where there is healing, you will bring wholeness. And where there is brokenness, your touch. Where there is division, unity. And where there is darkness, light. These things we lift to you in the power of our Savior Jesus' name. Amen.
forth today. May you go forth. May we go forth in the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, in God's power, God's love, and in self-control. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.